this is the definition that we kind of glossed over, uh, but this is the so-called rigorous definition of the limit. And it, it uh, uses the, these epsilons and deltas, but actually we, we really did look at it because we look, when we considered the geometric viewpoint, we, we looked at it. So here we talked about epsilon and delta, and we said that we would say that uh, the limit of this function f as x approaches a, so here's a, some position a, this is a peculiar example actually because a is right on the border. Normally we would talk about an a right here, but in any case, here's the a, and as, we, uh, as x approaches a, we want to show that the limit of the function, the value of the function is getting closer and closer to l. So uh, what, the way that that's done in that so-called epsilon delta definition is that we say that um, we say, okay, well, how close do we have to be to L? So suppose we want to, we want to say that we're this close to L. In other words, a, a ball or a sphere of radius epsilon. So can we find a, uh, a disk around A uh, that is uh, so that everything in that disk goes into here. And then the idea is that no matter how close we want to draw this sphere around L, so can we find a disk over here so that everything in the disk goes never goes beyond that? And if we can keep doing this, uh, then we say that the limit uh, as X approaches A is L. So that's... Uh, more or less the definition, the rigorous definition. However, she says one of the biggest drawbacks of uh, definition 2.2 is that it is not at all useful for determining the value of a limit. You must already have a candidate limit in mind and must also be to be prepared to confront some delicate work with inequalities and so on. So we didn't go through the, that uh, work with the inequalities. But um, anyway, she says that you have to have a candidate limit. You have to say, well, I think the limit is L. So she says uh, the following two theorems uh, make finding limits uh, considerably easier. So first of all, this theorem says that if you have a limit as x approaches a of a function f equals L, and you also have another uh, you also find that it's uh, also equal to M, then L must be equal to M. That is, you can't have two different limits as X approaches A. So that's uh, that the limit is unique. And then here we have some properties of uh, limits. So this says that if you take uh, the limit as X approaches A of F, and that's equal to L, and then the limit as X approaches A of G, and that's equal to m. Now you can ask, well, what's the limit as x approaches a of f plus g? And it says it turns out to be quite simple. It's just l plus m. And uh, then we have one, another one that says uh, if you have the limit as x approaches a of f equals l, then what about if you multiply this f times k? What? How does the limit change? And again, it's uh, simple. The answer is just that it's k times l. If you have k times f, the limit is k times l. And then here we have, uh, this is a, um, this is a scalar value function of a vector a. And uh, so suppose this one, f, its limit is l as x approaches uh, a. And uh, then we have another scalar value function of a vector x. Uh, and its limit as x also approaches a is m. Then what about the product of f and g? So it turns out nicely that the limit is just the limit of f times g as x goes to a is l times m. And then also it works uh, similarly when you take the quotient of f divided by g, it's l divided by m, but then we have to make sure that the m is not equal to zero. 
and we can you you can go through this uh, we can use this to um, uh, show or to find limits so suppose we wanted suppose we had this function so this is a, a function of two variables so it's a function from r2 but the output is just uh, a, a, um, a scalar so this is a function from r2 to r and we can see that since it's a function in r2 we have to talk about both x and y going to some point and um, turns out that using the above these th these properties above here, that uh, the limit of this uh, function uh, will is it's very easy to do it. All you have to do is plug in for x you plug in a and for y you plug in b. So for x you plug in a so you have a squared and so on. For y you plug in b so you have b here and b here. And they explain exactly how you take these properties to show that. So you can go through that. And then uh, suppose you have a, more, this is a polynomial. We say this is a polynomial uh, in X and Y. We might have, but this is not the only possible polynomial in X and Y. We could have uh, different exponents here and different um, coefficients and so on. So this is a general the expression for a general polynomial in two variables. So the general polynomial in two variables, we'll call it P, and this is the expression. And then we can, then they show that um, the limit for a general polynomial uh, at <clears throat> when we have a point X comma Y goes to another point A comma B then uh, we can just, again, just replace uh, x and y by a and b in the general polynomial, and, that's, and then you get this. So we've replaced x and y by a and b, just like we did up here. We replaced x and y for this particular polynomial by a and b, but you can do that in general for any polynomial. And then they go on to expand this a little bit more, and talk about not just a polynomial in two variables, but a polynomial in n variables. So this is the expression for a uh, polynomial in n variables. And similarly, uh, if we talk about x going to a, now x is going to uh, be have is going to be an R n because this is a uh, polynomial in n variables, so x is going to be in Rn, and a will also be in Rn. But anyway, we can just, again, just replace all the um, component x's with the component a's. So you take the start here, and you do the limit, and you can just do that. So this makes, this says that doing limits on, for polynomials is easy. There's no, you can just, if you want to uh, find the limit as x goes to a, you just replace uh, a in the appropriate places in the polynomial. Now, that theorem does not work if you have something like this. So if you have a um, rational, we call this a rational function. If you have a rational function, this is not a polynomial. It's, it's the ratio of two polynomials, but it's not a polynomial itself. So that you can't just... Uh, replace x by a uh, in here in general. Now, depends, uh, it may, and sometimes we can, but in general you can't do it. So they show what, that the limit of the top part, if we just did the limit of the top, we, did, we do have a, a formula that says the limit of a ratio is equal to the ratio of the limits. But in the limit of the top part, you can just, uh, it's a polynomial, so you can just replace here, replace what's in here by negative 1 and 0, and you do that, you get 4. Um, however, the bottom part, uh, oh, sorry, so for this one, the bottom part, uh, you can also 
replace because it's a polynomial. The bottom part of this is a polynomial. So you can replace um, by negative 1 and 0. You get 1, which is not 0. So it's OK. You, so we get 4 over 1. So the limit is 4 over 1. So that one was OK. But this one may not work. So here, uh, we're going to 0, 0. And we see that the denominator is going to be a problem. So we can't use that theorem up here. We can't use this because that stipulates that the bottom, g is the bottom, uh, is not zero. So we can't use that one, that theorem. So she says, of course, not all limits of quotient expressions are as simple as the last example. For instance, we can't use theorem 2.5 to evaluate this since the limit of the bottom is zero. Indeed, so since the limit as x goes to uh, x, y goes to 0, 0, of the top is also 0, then this is called indeterminate, because they're both 0, 0 divided by 0. So we can, however, we can try to explore the limits along certain paths to see what happens. So um, just to get some kind of feel for what's going on. So maybe we can't talk, we can't use that theorem, but we can perhaps still explore some uh, limits along some particular paths. So anyway, let's try that here. So along y equals 0, y equals 0 means along the x-axis. So as x goes to 0 along the x-axis. So what happens? So remember, we've done something like this before. So we can say y equals 0, both here and here. We get that get that and then this is just one so we get the answer is one so we did find the limit uh, along this path then they do it again now they do it uh, x equals zero so that's along the y-axis then you replace these by zeros so they get minus and plus so you get negative one so we can see that a court, uh, if you go along the two different paths, you get different answers. So that already means that the limit doesn't exist. OK, uh, let's look at theorem 2.6. So let's look at what I wrote over here. So suppose we have a function f, which goes from r2 to r4. So that means it's a function of x, y. But uh, the result is, a, is in R4, so it has four components. Uh, so it's a vector uh, with four, four elements or of length four. And um, so let's suppose that, so here I'm giving the result, the output. So it has to have four components. So I put in three commas here. And then I made up some components. So let's suppose the first component was x squared y. The second was x plus y. The next one was x cubed plus 1. And the last one was y to the ninth. OK, so suppose we want to talk, uh, inquire about limits of this function. So we might say, what's the limit of this function x as x, y? Remember, this, this is in R2. So I have to say what happens to something in R2. So this goes to this. So this theorem, theorem 2.6, says that if you want to do this limit of this vector valued function from R2 to R4, you can evaluate, you can evaluate the, these are called the component functions. One component function, another component, another, another. There are four component functions. You can evaluate the limits of the component functions individually and then get the result. So that means we could we could take this x squared y and say what happens as x y goes to 0, 1. We could take this one, what happens as x y goes to 0, 1, and so on. So these are all easy to do. Uh, in fact, these are just polynomials in this case, but they don't have to be polynomials, but these are. So you could just do this. This would just be 0 times 1, which is 0. 
and this one would be 0 plus 1, which is 1. This one would be 0 plus 1, which is 1. And this would be 1. So this would be the limit. So the point, though, is that you can evaluate, you can do, you can work on the individual components separately to get the overall limit. So let's read that theorem, theorem 2.6. So it says if f is a, a function from r n to r m, like this, it's a vector value function because m is not 1. Uh, although this also applies when m is 1, but it's trivial in that case, then the limit as x goes to a of f equals l. If it equals l, so this is the limit that we got here, uh, where l equal has the following components, l1 da, 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 up to lm. So here we have four components. Then, if and only if, or then, um, what does this stand for? F sub i means the individual component function. So this is F sub 1, this is F sub 2, this is F sub 3, and F sub 4. Then the limit of the individual component functions is this. So first one will be here, second, the last one will be there. Okay, so that is what we did over here. Okay, let's uh, finish by doing example 15, and this is a big, uh, important example. So let's do this one. So let's uh, consider, suppose we have a matrix here. So and it's an M by N matrix because there are M rows and N columns. And suppose we have a vector, which we can also think of as N by one matrix. So the length of this vector is n, so it has n components. And so we can think of this vector as an element from Rn, because it has n components. So we can multiply uh, this matrix by this vector because this is n by n and this is n by 1. So these match, so we can multiply them. And when we do that, uh, what's, the, what's the size of the result? It's going to be m by 1. So the result is going to have m components. So we can view that as a, an element of our m. So the result is something in our m, and the x here is something in our n. So we can say that we're starting with something in our n, and getting out something in our m when we take when we multiply this vector by this matrix by a matrix of this size so we can say that this matrix multiplication is a function which takes something from our n and sends it to something in our m so we can say that this matrix multiplication, which we can say takes something in our, x is in R n, and the output when we multiply by a is something in R m. So matrix this matrix multiplication is a function from R n to R m, and this is a very important example. That is. To understand that matrix multiplication like this is uh, represents a function. So we start with something, we start with this vector, we multiply it times some matrix, and that whole process is a function. And it's in this case, it's a, I mean, we would say it's a function from R n to R m. So consider the linear mapping. Now they use the word linear, but it's not clear why they said that. Well, let's just say, consider the mapping from Rn to Rm defined by f of x equals A, some matrix A, times x, where um, the matrix A, we can remember, this is another notation for the matrix A, 
is an m by n matrix of real numbers. Okay. So now, once we understand that that's a function, then we can say, what's the limit as x goes to b, or this x goes to some value b, or some vector b. And it turns out that we can just replace the x by b. So we start out with ax, then we do the limit as x goes to b, and the answer turns out to be just a times b, a times this vector b. So the limit is very easy to calculate for this kind of example. Now she says that the, it's theorem 2.6 above here that implies that you can, that this limit can be done this way. But what was this theorem again? It said that you can do uh, the limits of the components individually. So what, what does that have to do with what we're doing here? Well, when we multiply a times x, remember we're supposed to end up with something in Rm. So how do we get the elements in Rm? We have to get m elements, and what are they? So we're going to take this row times this column, and that's going to give us this. Then we're going to take this row, this row, times this column, and that's going to give us this. And we're going to do that for each of these rows. That's for all m rows. So we're going to get m elements here. So these are the component functions. This one is the first component function, just like before. This was the first component function. Now the first component function for this function here is here. And the second, we have to have m component functions, just as we had four. We have m of them. Here's the first one. Here's the second one, and here's the last one. So if we want to know the limit as x goes to b, we can just wor work on the individual component functions individually. So we can say, well, what is the limit as x goes to b for this? But this is just a polynomial, and we know how to do that. And the answer is what? It's a1, 1, b1, a1, 2, b2, a1, n, b, n. And then the next one's going to be a2, 1, b1, a2, 2, b2, and so on. So we're just going to fill in the b's in here. But that is exactly, so that's here. We fill in the b's. So you can read through this. But we fill in the b's. But that's exactly a, b. If you have a vector b here, and you multiply it times this, then you get exactly this. So this is a, b. So that shows what we wanted to show, which is the limit uh, as x goes to b is just a, b. When the function is a, x, when this function is a, x, the limit is a, b. So that's very nice and clean and simple. And it's also very important. Okay, we are going to stop here. But next we need to talk about what is meant by a continuous function. And first we review what we mean by a continuous function, or just a function of a single variable, like these are these continuous. Is this continuous? Is this continuous? So we review that idea. Then we uh, maybe talk about from R2 to R. That would be on a surface. Uh, what do we mean by continuous? And then we go more generally to um, uh, what do we mean by continuous in the case of a function from Rn to Rm. And then we continue to dis discuss that. This is a, a theorem about uh, continuous functions. And then we have the proofs. And finally, that takes us to the end of this section. This section. 
So finally, we can finally get into the derivative, which is what, what we've been uh, studying everything before in order just to build up a set of tools to talk about derivatives for functions from Rn to Rm. That's what we want in our course because uh, we need to understand uh, the idea of the gradient descent algorithm and um, that refers to derivatives from Rn to Rm. So we, we need to understand that. And everything we've done so far, everything with vectors and and parametric equations and limits and so on has all been to prepare us for this. So we will get to this soon.